That was the defense's rebuttal in the Anissa Wire, so-called Slenderman case out of Wisconsin, which wrapped up a couple of weeks ago and we barely had a chance to cover here on the Law News Network. The defense arguing ultimately successfully that the defendant, Anissa Wire, should be committed to a mental health facility and not be held criminally responsible, in other words, serve her time in prison, over the stabbing of a classmate who miraculously survived. Now, the jurors came back with a verdict for him late in the evening in this case, and it turns out that it was confusing and ultimately didn't make any sense legally. So the judge sent them back to try to hammer things out and get the form filled out properly uh, or in a way that made sense under the law. So let's listen to this conversation back and forth between the judge and the attorneys and the jury to try to figure out exactly where the case should go from there. We will be back to talk more about the Jessica Chambers case coming up here on the Law News Network in a few minutes. And thank you and, and good evening. We have the uh, jury has reached a verdict. We've been told that they had the verdict at 7.47 p.m. As uh, previously noted, we're asking the, uh, have the alternates who have been here for the process to come into court. We'll now bring the jury in. <coughs> All right, thank you, please be seated. We, uh, we have the jury in the courtroom. I'll ask uh, juror 4161 if you're the presiding juror. Okay, and has the jury reached a verdict? Yes, All right, thank you. Then I'd ask you to deliver the verdict to uh, our bailiff. I have the, uh, the verdict. It is uh, with uh, dissenting jurors. I'm going to uh, provide the uh, verdict to the uh, clerk, ask her to make copies of the verdict and provide it to the attorneys. There's an issue on the verdicts that I want to discuss with the attorneys. So for that, uh, be, to be off the uh, outside the presence of the jury. So I'm going to excuse the jurors. All right. The uh, jurors will return to their jury room, respective jury room. All right, thank you. Please be seated. The, uh, without, uh, at this point, reading the verdict, my, uh, I wanted to review with the attorneys the uh, issues of the dissenting juror. There's uh, two dissenting jurors on each of the two questions, which uh, leaves a verdict of uh, 10 uh, out of 12. The, juror, the dissenting jurors, however, are different for each of the questions. One, one juror is the same dissenting juror on each question, then there are two other dissenting jurors, one in each question. Now, <coughs> that is a potential inconsistent verdict. However, my reading of the law indicates that although that's an inconsistency, that there are sufficient jurors with a consistent verdict to, uh, to then have that be the verdict. I want the parties to, uh, to be aware of that potential challenge that's my reading of it. <coughs> if the I have, if you want to take uh, a moment, I, this is all uh, on a 5-6 verdict with 10 out of 12. There's potential for this to happen, and it's been a litigated issue. I copied one case, pertinent parts of the case, uh, 163 Wisconsin 2nd, 439, Zentech, Z-I-N-T-E-K versus Perichek, P-E-R-C-H-I-K, with the pertinent uh, discussion in it. If you wish to take a moment to read this, I'll provide it for you to read it before we go further, and we'll be in recess for a few moments. Certainly, sir. <coughs> All right. See, I determined at times we'd have a sidebar conference uh, we have a way to administer that, but I thought this was a, a better way to address the issues. That's why I asked the jury to be excluded at this point. 
So well, I'll, we'll be in recess for about five minutes. I'll give you an opportunity to read the case. Doing that, I am concerned that with the inconsistency. The, uh, so I'll look for suggestions. Judge, I'm very concerned as well. I don't believe under the circumstances here, a juror can vote no for question one and yes for question two. I don't believe that's jurors following the law under the circumstances. Um, I don't believe this can be a valid verdict. I, the Zentech case doesn't, in my opinion, really touch on this issue given the um, separate defendants in that case and I think the issues are just very different. Um, again, I, I don't think, given the mandates of the law here, that if you answer question one, yes, then you answer question two. If you've answered question one, no, I don't see under any circumstance how you can then answer question two, yes. That's completely inconsistent and I don't believe that juror's vote should be counted as a yes to question two and that does not leave um, 10 yes votes to question two. Uh, Attorney McMahon. Your Honor, I think actually that Zintik would apply. And Your Honor, the jury instruction does not say, state that the jury instruction gives instruction to the entire jury, not to individual jurors. And if 10 people have found that my client is mentally ill, then the question for the jury becomes, was she able to conform her conduct? Or was she able to recognize the wrongfulness? I believe that the analysis of Zintac that you need the requisite number of jurors for each question is appropriate here. Again, jury instructions are not specific to each juror. It is to the jury as a whole. I read, I read Zentac to uh, state on the matter of inconsistencies in this type of verdict that it must be the same 10 jurors on each of the uh, questions. And what I'm concerned about as I analyze the vote is that it's not the same 10. And that, uh, that to me is the inconsistency in the verdict. Zentech addresses that issue. There's another case cited in this. Uh, I think it's Montgomery, Beebe versus Montgomery Ward that goes into more detail about that issue. So I, that would make it a, uh, would bring about the inconsistent verdict issue. The, uh, there is a, when I reviewed our jury instructions, the uh, jury instruct, part of the jury instruction that uh, discusses the 5-6 verdict does not include the language contained in instruction 180, which I'll send down. This may be a situation where the court would uh, be in a position to give 180 and 520. 520 is the Allen instruction. Well, and again, Judge, for the record, my concern is um, one juror dissenting on question one but answering yes to question two because it clearly states that if you've answered question one yes, then you answer the following question. So a no vote to question one uh, does not allow that juror to give any other type of answer but a dissent to question two. Now, I, 
And I believe that that issue is addressed, in, if not in Zantac, in the uh, other case, case that I cited, that uh, my view of the law is that it's the same 10 within a, a, within a package of questions. In the Zantac case, there was, was a civil liability case, two doctors, malpractice case. There was a dissenting juror in each, but different for each of the two doctors. There they found that that wasn't an inconsistency because the same for the liability questions for each defendant, there was the same dissenting juror. So I'm reading that analysis to, to mean that if there's the same 10 jurors on each question in a package, and I see this as a package, both questions one and two are necessary to decide the case, that uh, that would that inconsistency can be overcome because it's the same 10, if it is the same 10. My concern is that in this case, it's not the same 10. Well, and this is somewhat even different than Zintec because yes. the questions here are such that you don't get to question two. Uh, it's dependent upon your answer to question one. Correct. No, I understand that. And it's, uh, and you may, you, may, you may be right. I haven't fully analyzed, right. analyzed your argument. But I'm satisfied it's an inconsistent verdict. My suggestion to cure it is to, or to give an opportunity for curing. Maybe it can't be cured. That's uh, for the jury to decide. Is to uh, provide them with the 180 instruction, which more clearly states the law on the 5-6 verdict. And to do a uh, read the 520 which uh, asks them to go back and continue to deliberate. So any comments on that, that solution? I have no objection to that solution, Judge, at this point. Your Honor, we're maintaining our position that the, the jury instruction on not guilty by reason of mental disease or defect does not specify that a juror who dissented on one cannot vote on two. The jurors, clearly there are ten jurors who felt that there was a mental disease or disorder. And the question then for the jury is, looking at that, do you find that the person can either not conform their conduct or lack substantial capacity to appreciate the wrongfulness? It's not directed to each juror. It is directed to the jury as a whole. Well, again, although I, I appreciate the, the, the state's position, I'm reading the, uh, the law to require the same 10 on each question. And this is not the same 10. I understand that, Your Honor, but I don't believe that that is required because in mental disease or defect analysis in question two, they don't even, they don't require unanimity on what the jury finds there, just that it be found. You could have five that believe that the person couldn't conform their conduct and three that believe they couldn't conform their conduct and they under, couldn't understand the wrongfulness and a couple who just believe that they couldn't understand the wrongfulness. It doesn't require that. I'm going to take the other to read the example. Uh, section uh, section 805.09 of the statute, sub 2, says a verdict agreed to by five six of the jurors shall be the verdict of the jury. If more than one question must be answered to arrive at a verdict on the same claim, the same five six of the jurors must agree on all questions. So the uh, the issue then, as presented by Attorney McMahon, is does question one and two constitute, as I call it, a package or a claim? I'm satisfied in reading the statute and looking at the nature of the questions in this case 
that uh, you can't have a completed verdict unless the jury responds to uh, both questions, questions one and two, with the correct number. And uh, we don't have that in this case. They have the opportunity to uh, answer yes or no to both questions. And in order to have that yes or no be sustained, it has to be the same 10 on each question. So again, the, uh, my, my proposal and my thought is that I will read 180 and instruct on 520, which is the uh, Allen instruction, and have the jury go back and continue based upon those additional items. So that'll be the order of the court, so ordered. With uh, that being the case, we'll bring the jury in as well as the alternates so they hear the instruction. All right. All jurors are back in the uh, jury room, or back in the courtroom. You may be seated. The alternates can come in as well. The, uh, the court reviewed the verdict. The verdict wasn't read in court. However, I did discuss the, the answers of the dissenting jurors with the attorneys and determined that I should re-instruct you on a por portion of the verdict and uh, have you go back and deliberate further based upon all of the instructions, including the new instructions that I give you, that I'll give you at this so with that, then our, uh, the alternate jurors are here so they can hear the instructions as well. And uh, then we'll have copies for the 12 jurors will be returned to the jury room. With that being said, I have the packet of instructions that you came in with along with the verdict form to be returned to you. Agreement by 10 <coughs> more jurors is sufficient to become your verdict. Jurors have a duty to consult with one another and to deliberate for the purpose of reaching agreement. If you can do so consistently with your duty as a juror, at least the same 10 jurors should agree on all the answers. I ask you to be unanimous if you can. At the bottom of the verdict, you'll find a place provided where dissenting jurors, if there be any, will sign their names and list any future juror numbers and state the answer or answers of the verdict with which you do not agree. Either the blank lines or the space below them may be used for that purpose. You jurors are competent to decide the disputed issues of fact in this case. You, you jurors are as competent to decide the disputed issues of fact in this case as the next jurors that may be called to determine such issues. You are not going to be made to agree, nor are you going to be kept out until you do agree. It is your duty to make an honest and sincere attempt to arrive at a verdict. Jurors should not be obstinate, they should be open-minded. They should listen to the arguments of others and talk matters over freely and fairly and make an honest effort to come to a conclusion on all of the issues presented to them. You will please retire again to the jury room. With that, then, we'll give you these, these additional instructions, plus what you have before, return the jury to the jury room for further deliberation, consistent with the instructions I've read to you. So, jury is excused. All right. Now, at that point, the jury in the Anissa Wire case was sent back to deliberate a little bit more, and we're joined by our next guest here. Stephen Mulroy is with the University of Memphis School of Law, former federal prosecutor, also works as a criminal defense attorney. Stephen, good to have you back here on Law News. Thanks for having me back. So uh, we're, we're going to talk about a couple of cases here. The uh, Anissa Wire case out of Wisconsin, uh, the Slender Man case, a lot of people know it as an interesting case because uh, it procedurally is just a question as to whether or not the defendant is going to wind up in some kind of psychiatric care or in some kind of incarceration. Now, right. when you have young people who are doing things to satisfy the assumed urges of some kind of fictitious character, is it sort of a no-brain decision to say, you know, look, the person might be better served in psychiatric care than getting thrown to the wolves in a full-blown prison? 
That sounds right to me, Aaron. If the jury does, as a factual matter, buy that she really did believe uh, that there was a Slender Man and that it was necessary to obey Slender Man in order to save lives or whatever it is that she's saying. I mean, once you make that leap, then the idea that she needs psychiatric care is a pretty, pretty easy leap to make. Yeah, and ultimately that's what the jury did. The reason we're kind of going back and looking at it here on Law News today is because it happened in the midst of the Holly Bobo case where you also right. provided some expertise and many of our viewers didn't even get a chance to sort of review the procedure uh, and the possibility uh, of what the jury had to decide. From a procedural standpoint, it's interesting though because the burden kind of shifts to the defendant and so the defendant gives the closing argument first and then the state and then the defendant goes again. It's the exact opposite of what we usually see in a case. Right. And it's not that uncommon for states to put an affirmative uh, defense burden on the defendant when it comes to insanity. Uh, it's one of those uh, very common things. You know, the state can put the burden on the prosecution to negate a defense or on the defendant to prove a defense. And usually with insanity, that burden is placed on the defendant. So just as you said, it's reversed. It'll be the defendant going first and last and the prosecution in the middle. Yeah, so ultimately the jury decided that the psychiatric care would be better for this particular individual. But, you know, I mean, gosh, it, it's, it, it's the sort of thing that most people would look and say, A, there is no Slender Man, and B, Slender Man's not going to come and murder my family if I don't go stab someone 19 times. Thankfully, the victim survived uh, almost miraculously, it seems. So, yeah. you know... I, I'm, I'm sitting here with a bit of a conflict, and I, I guess I would have hated to have been on that jury. Well, I can understand your um, agonizing over it, but, you know, at the end of the day, again, it goes down to the factual determination. I mean, if, as a juror, you actually do believe that the defendant sincerely believed all of this stuff about Slender Man, then I think under the law, you have to say that psychiatric care is the best uh, result here. Um, you know, the law says that if you really don't understand what reality is or you don't really understand what, you know, what's going on, then you really don't deserve traditional punishment. You deserve to be cared for and, and, and made whole. Now, let's be clear about something else here. Just because the defendant winds up in psych psychiatric care does not mean she's off the hook. Right. No, that's right. That's right. Um, she is she would then continue to be given uh, psychiatric care until such time that the doctors decided that she was no longer insane and no longer a danger to herself or to others and could be released into society. And, it, and in some cases, that uh, could actually result in a longer period of institutionalization than the sentence itself. So, it, you know, it really, you don't know exactly what's going to happen until she's uh, given that kind of care. Now, I don't have a lot of experience being in those sorts of facilities. Uh, what are they like? I I'm guessing as, as someone who's done both prosecution and defense work that you're a little more versed in them than I am. Well, you know, actually, I have to be candid, although I was involved in prosecuting cases, you know, what would happen to the defendants afterwards, the details of uh, their incarceration, or in this case, mental treatment, wasn't really something that I dealt with on a day-to-day -day basis. So, you know, my knowledge is, uh, is secondhand. I just do know this. I do know that um, the person can be released after a short period of time if they decide that she's cured, or she could be uh, kept there for quite a long time indeed, even longer than uh, had she been sentenced to a traditional conviction. It all depends on the doctor's choice about is this person cured, is this person a danger to herself or to others, or can she be released to civil society? Now, I know it's impossible to know the law in all 50 states, but does the judicial system have any oversight over that uh, function of when someone uh, such as this defendant would be released? Well, yes. I mean, um, just like with regular involuntary civil commitments, uh, independent of an actual criminal trial, the uh, person who's institutionalized has the ability to contest the institutionalization. You know, not all the time, but after a reasonable period of time, um, she could petition to be released. You know, the, the judges would have to decide, was she a danger to herself or to others? That's the standard. But I believe in those kinds of cases, the judges will tend to be deferential to competent medical opinion. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, we've decided as a society to sort of kick this to the medical professionals rather than let the judges try to figure out exactly what's going on in an area where they're not well versed. And that's the way the law works. Uh, you know, it's I think that's right. It's ultimately a mistake to say that, um, as I said before, that this somehow lets someone off the hook because the treatment, uh, I have to assume, is thorough. 
uh, and it's being done by people who know what they're doing. Well, I think that's right. I mean, I think you put the nail on the head earlier, Aaron, when you said that we've made a decision as a society to trust the medical profession on these things, at both as to the initial determination, the diagnosis, and then later on deciding when she has been cured or when she's not been cured. Um, I, I know that you know staying in those facilities is no picnic. It's probably less of a, a grueling experience than traditional incarceration, but again, our policy is that if the person really was insane, then she doesn't really deserve the kind of grueling experience that we would have for a traditional conviction. Now, ultimately, this case uh, where we just ended our last clip was one where the jury inaccurately filled out the form. So the judge had to talk to him and say, hey, look, what you did doesn't make any sense under the law. And uh, I remember getting a look at it, and, uh, you know, they basically said, well, uh, I don't remember the exact terms of what they did, but it was something that just legally made absolutely no sense. Uh, so the judge had to send them back to deliberate again. Uh, don't see it all the time, but it's also not that common for folks who aren't used to sitting around as you and I do and study statutes all the time. Right, right. Well, and that's the, that's the problem is, you know, you have laymen uh, who are given sometimes complicated jury instructions and then they do their best to deal with them. And then when you have these multi-part jury uh, interrogatory forms where, you know, if the answer to question one is yes, then you move on to question three. If no, then you skip to question four. I mean, it, it can be uh, confusing. I myself, when I was a, a clerk for a federal judge, had a case or two where we had one of those jury interrogatory forms and the jurors uh, filled it out the wrong way or an inconsistent way. And in this case, when you catch it in time and can send it back to the jurors and ask them to t uh, take a second look, that's the best result. But I'm aware of cases where the inconsistency wasn't really caught until after the jurors had been released. And then you had endless litigation over, well, what did the jury actually mean when they filled out the form? Oh, yeah. I mean, at that point, don't you just wish you could call the jury back up and say, get back in here and explain yeah, what's yeah, going on yeah. here? Yeah, just want and, to call them up, right. And I don't blame it on the, the jurors. And as we said, you know, the, the more complex law becomes, uh, and law becomes complex, is the result of disputes. And uh, as more and more disputes are had, we try to find more and more resolutions to disputes, and it, it pushes the law further and further. And the upshot is, is that... Uh, it just oftentimes gets more and more complicated. Uh, I think, I Aaron, that's absolutely right, and it's just an inevitable consequence of the, you know, as you said, the co increasing complexity of the law. When jurors, juries were first invented during the common law days, the law was pretty simple, and anybody, you know, literate or not, could serve on a jury. That's no longer the case today. Well, uh, I, I put a lot of faith into the jury system, and a, a lot of the cases that we cover here at Law News, I look at the verdicts and say, you know, that makes sense, or it fits with... Uh, a bit of a prediction that I've made sitting here watching, um, and it happens time and time again. So I don't think that that their thinking is off. It's just the sometimes it's the way the forms are are worded, and sometimes it's the way the jury gets the information from the court. Uh, long before I went to law school, I sat on a civil jury, and all of the instructions were read to us. And by the time we got back there, we just had this one-page form to fill out. And we all sort of looked at one another and said, okay, well, what do we do with all this information we just had? Uh, when I'm, I study a statute, I need to have it in front of me. Absolutely. You know, I need to I'm not at all surprised to hear that. You know, it has long been the case. And even nowadays, sometimes in some courts, they don't let you take the written jury instructions back into the jury room with you. So you're supposed to be listening to 19, 20 pages of instructions and then remember it all when you go back into the jury room. It's not realistic. And even when you do have the written instructions sent back into the jury room, Judges are reluctant to rewrite the boilerplate that they get from the appellate court decisions into more understandable plain English for fear that somehow they will miss something and then that will become the grounds for an appeal. So a lot of times the jury instructions just cut and paste from the appellate uh, court opinions, which of course is couched in legalese. So even the written jury instructions sometimes can be somewhat impenetrable to uh, a lay juror. It's, it's a real issue. I'm remembering a, a supervisor at a legal residency that I did while in law school saying uh, that the, the modern trend, at least in the state where I was, was to cut all of the, the Latin and all of the legalese, as we call it, out of the writing, may, boil this down, because then if an appeals court latches on it, hopefully they'll use that language and not confuse the heck out of every one of us, uh, including us who are doing the writing. Uh, right, you know, absolutely. Uh, and I think the trend is positive in that direction. You know, you see these model jury instructions or pattern jury instructions. Every court, every jurisdiction has them. And in recent years, you know, they have become boiled down and a little bit more plain English in style.
Yeah, I want to switch gears now, Stephen, and talk about the Quinton Tellis case, which is hopefully coming up tomorrow here on Law News. And we're waiting to see exactly what's going to happen with jury selection, because we have a case that's happening in a small area in a relatively rural state, Mississippi, where uh, a young woman was brutally burned. 98% of her body was burned. She was airlifted to a hospital. She uh, passed the next day, uh, just an excruciatingly horrible situation. And it happened in an area near, uh, as I understand it, her mother's house, uh, where people know her, know her family, and they're bringing a jury in from 200 miles away. So right now, the judge that's going to hear the case is 200 miles away trying to figure out who they want to load up on the bus to bring 200 miles back to the location where this trial is going to be had. They've got 100 people sitting there in court today, and uh, as of about an hour ago, they had uh, basically sent 40 of them home, and the problem wasn't that those 40 people knew a lot about the case, although it has been publicized worldwide. The problem was that they can't deal with the sequestration period. This is going to be another case where there's probably going to be late testimony. There are going to be a group of people, 12, 15, 16, depending on the number of alternates, uh, living out of a hotel for a couple of weeks, hearing testimony on Saturdays, as we understand it, and uh, 200 miles away from home. That's, that's a big burden for jurors to carry. It is a big burden for jurors to carry. I don't envy them their task, nor do I envy the trial judge the task of dealing with the logistics of all this, of having to select people who live far away and busing them to the location and putting them up and managing them. Um, it can be very complicated and burdensome for everybody involved. I guess, you know, the one silver lining is if you do take people from outside of that town, then hopefully they will be unbiased and not tainted by, you know, any emotions or covers, press covers that occurred in the city itself. You know, it raises questions uh, about what the proper cure is. It, I know that a lot of people in the legal profession complain about having to jump through all these extra hoops to put a trial on. But as, as somebody who wears both a legal and a journalistic hat, uh, I have to then turn around and say, well, you know, the First Amendment says we can cover our court processes. And we, the people, have an interest in understanding how these processes roll out. So in this case... It seems to me that the prosecution has played the case pretty close to the vest. There's not a lot out there about it. So we're very curious to see exactly, exactly where this is going to go once the testimony begins, possibly tomorrow, maybe Wednesday, if they can't get enough people seated out of that pool of 100. Uh, so, you know, I can't uh, now I haven't been there locally. I don't know how much the prosecutor has said out of court. I, I am under the impression, though, based on what I have read, that the state has played the case pretty close to the vest and really right. hasn't right. done too much uh, poisoning of the jury pool, at least through that vehicle. Now, I think that's essentially correct, Aaron, because, you know, there's certainly no lack of media interest in this case. And yet the mere fact that you and I are still somewhat in the dark about exactly what the prosecution's case is this close to the trial, I think confirms what you're saying. The prosecution has done a very good job of keeping it close to the vest, and I think appropriately so. Uh, yeah, I agree. Um, and, and I've been harping on that topic for more than a decade, so uh, we'll, I'm sure I will continue to uh, as things go forward. But we can guess at least a little bit about where they're going to go. The state's uh, witness list, uh, or request for subpoenas as it's titled, has a, a number of people uh, on it. Uh, we anticipate that these are the people who will be testifying, and the subpoenas uh, were set for uh, tomorrow at 8 a.m. local time for the courthouse in Batesville, Mississippi, where this will be tried. And uh, it, it's a relatively lengthy list. I have seen longer lists. I have seen shorter ones. But most of the people on the list are first responders, the local fire department. Again, remember, this victim uh, was burned very, very, very severely. We've got a lot of first responders. Looks like every first responder who dealt with this is on the witness list, and that's the bulk of who's on it. We have a number of medical professionals. We have at least four of them right off the bat that I see. We've got the medical examiner's office, uh, of course, uh, some people from the local sheriff's department, and uh, a few other uh, members of the uh, bureaus of investigation, both federally and in the state of Mississippi, a couple of cell phone people, and beyond that, we don't have much couple of lab analysts, couple of cell phone people, a lot of first responders. That 
more or less tells us where the case is going to go. They've got a lot of people who responded to the scene, a couple of cell phone people to try to link the defendant up with the victim. Uh, and uh, I'm assuming that the lab analysts are people who tested for the accelerants in what was left of the wreckage of this poor victim's uh, car and then ultimately her body. It doesn't look like right. the state has much else beyond that. Well, unless the uh, lab technicians have some DNA evidence that we haven't heard about, and I think you're correct in that the, the first responders and the sheriff's deputies and the, the medical people are going to be able to testify to the how this happened, and it sounds like it truly is an excruciating ordeal, uh, obviously, uh, very shocking. But in terms of the who tying it to the defendants, I'm not sure who else besides the cell phone witnesses can, can link that up. Yeah, you know, I mean, and, and it raises a, a question as to how we're going to say this, see this case tried. Is it going to be a case that's heavy on emotion? Is it going to be a case that's heavy on uh, procedure? Is it going to be heavy on relying on the first responders to really set up a horrific scene? Is that the way this is going to be presented to the jury? Or is it going to be really heavy on that cell phone testimony? I, I think the better angels of my nature would be a lot more comfortable if it was heavy on the cell phone testimony to say, hey, look, we exam and apparently they have just a, a mountain of cell phone records to go through in this case. It, it, the page, uh, the number of pages of documents that they reviewed w was astronomical. I can't remember it off the top of my head, but I would hope that that evidence is going to carry the day because again, it, it's not so much a question as to what happened, but who, as you said and the cell phone right. records would answer the who. This is a case where the prosecutor can't just gloss over the cell phone records in a couple of hours and say, oh yeah, they link up. This is a case where you're gonna to have to have a skillful mapping, skillful storytelling to say, hey, look, um, and I'm speculating here, but I'm asking if you agree with me, Stephen, is it gonna be a better case if the prosecutor says, hey, look, we've got a map, and we can put them together here, 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 and here, and then at this time, they separate and that is about the time we believe the fire broke out because the first responders showed up, you know, X number of minutes later. To me, that's the kind of case or that's the kind of storytelling out of the prosecution that this case is going to need to get a clean conviction. Well, I mean, I think I do agree with you, Aaron. You know, as we said before, it's the who that's most crucial here. And only the cell phone witnesses seem to be able to provide that unless there's something I don't know about. And it would seem to me that if you did want to prove beyond a reasonable doubt, based on the facts and not on emotion, then you would have to have some pretty competent testimony that suggested that the defendant was in the location of the scene of the crime, around the time of the scene of the crime, and then, as you indicated, departed right around the time that the car was in, unfortunately engulfed in flame. And that evidence would be a strong link to uh, the defendant. And if we're just relying on the emotion of how horrible a death it was, that that doesn't seem to me like the kind of thing that we ought to be hoping for anyway in terms of, you know, a proper criminal justice system in operation. Uh, I would agree with you on that. Uh, now, I'm not saying that we won't have some emotional testimony here. I'm sure we probably will uh, because the facts are just that horrific. Uh, but again, it, it's not so much the what because we know a lot of that and the jury needs to hear that as well. But the question as to who did it, that's what I'm really curious to see what this cell data shows. You know, those horrible details really would be quite relevant after conviction when it comes, comes to sentencing. You know, that's the kind of thing that I think somebody would want to consider when, decide to, when deciding on imposing a sentence. But as we discussed uh, earlier, it seems like the sentence is already a foregone conclusion here. They're not seeking the death penalty. And under Mississippi law, as a habitual offender, he may not be eligible for life with parole, so that would leave life without parole as the sentence. Yeah, exactly. I sat down this afternoon about an hour and a half ago and started going through all the statutes here. Uh, it's called capital murder here, and the reason that, that the, the defendant is facing a capital murder statute is because of the uh, burning. Uh, that's the reason why it's capital murder. Uh, but Now, is, uh, is, there, is there any relevance to the fact that it was felony murder committed in the commission of a, an arson felony does that also make it capital yeah, eligible that, that's, or am I that's right? ultimately the, the element that they were going at is okay. my understanding here because it, it was uh, uh, it, it was the death of uh, Jessica Lane Chambers the victim along with the commission of third degree arson okay uh, so so that ultimately is why we're looking at a capital murder charge but the state said it would not seek the death penalty so 
uh, let me back the horse up a couple of steps here. There are three possible punishments for capital murder uh, in Mississippi. One is the death penalty, which the state said, no, we're not going to we're not going to seek it. So that's off the table. One right. is life without parole, the middle one. And then the other one is life with parole. But life with parole doesn't apply to someone who's charged as being a habitual criminal. And this particular defendant, Quentin Tellis, uh, and I have the paperwork right here in front of me, has uh, a couple of counts in uh, his rap sheet here. He's got a, fel a felony fleeing uh, that's one count. Uh, he's got a uh, burglary of a dwelling. He's got uh, another burglary of a dwelling here. So he's got those three charges, and apparently that's enough for the prosecutors to seek a habitual fender, offender enhancement to this. So that wipes his chance for parole off with uh, this particular uh, capital murder charge that he's facing. So uh, again, as you say, ultimately you eliminate possibility one, you eliminate possibility three, and that leaves you with two, which is life without parole. That's what they're going right. for. Now, does, right. I was uh, sort of speculating a little bit earlier as to why the state wouldn't look for the death penalty in this case because the facts are horrific on their own. But I'm wondering right. what you think about that. Is there a reason why the state might not want to go for the death penalty in this particular circumstance? One of the typical aggravating factors that uh, would allow you to get a jury, a sentencing jury, to go ahead and impose the death penalty as opposed to some sort of life imprisonment variation um, would be the especially cruel nature of the crime, you know, the fact that the victim was in, uh, was made to suffer, you know, based on these horrific facts, you would think it would be a prime candidate for that kind of at use of aggravating factors to get a death sentence. So, you know, just wondering why they didn't do it, it's, it might be that there is some residual doubt, even if they don't consider it to be a reasonable doubt about the identity of this particular defendant, because as we were discussing earlier, there may be a lack of direct slam dunk, rock solid identification of this particular defendant. If you have to make the jury draw inferences in order to conclude that it was this defendant and not somebody else who did this horrific thing, perhaps that's some part of the motivation of the prosecution to be a little bit um, less aggressive in terms of seeking the death penalty. That's exactly what I was thinking, because ultimately here, if what we have is the testimony of the first responders, we have the testimony of the medical examiner, the doctors who treated Jessica Chambers, if we have all of that, and then pretty much what's left is the cell phone testimony, that's not a lot for a death penalty conviction. A lot of times, juries just don't want to go there with the death penalty unless they have things like uh, DNA, unless they have uh, something that's even more heinous than this. And, and, and I hate saying that because this is heinous enough, uh, but it, it was not a mass shooting rampage. It, it wasn't uh, the, it, it just, you know, it, it's not there. Uh, and, and part of me thinks that it was probably a wise move by the state because the state can turn around and say, hey, we didn't even go for the top count. We're just asking you to send this person to prison for life and, uh, and so be it. Right. Right. And typically the kinds of things you look at for being a prime candidate for the actual imposition of the death penalty would be, as you mentioned, either multiple victims or the selection of a vulnerable victim like a child or someone who was, you know, mentally challenged or something um, or, you know, torture, uh, especially heinous, atrocious or cruel means of killing someone where you inflict a lot of uh, long time suffering or perhaps targeting a police officer. You know, those are the standard aggravating factors that you use. I think you could argue that, you know, death by burning uh, might qualify, but as you have mentioned, that would only be in the case in which you were pretty solid in your identification of the defendant, and, and maybe that's not the case here. I don't know. Yeah, what do we make of uh, the reality that this defendant is also facing this first-degree murder charge in Louisiana on top of this particular case? You know, it may be another factor that the prosecution, you know, thought of in not seeking the death penalty. You know, death penalty prosecutions do become more expensive. You know, there's an extra layer of review, typically, that the appellate courts will give and habeas corpus uh, review as well. You know, perhaps with so many different, uh, with this defendant being in jeopardy from so many different jurisdictions, that might have been part of it, too. 
Yeah, you know, part of me wonders exactly who's going to get the, the final uh, look at this particular defendant because uh, he's facing uh, th this second charge in Louisiana, and I have not gone all the way down the rabbit hole in figuring out exactly the way Louisiana is going to be dealing with it. So, um, you know, it may be that, uh, and I'm trying to line the dates up here as I speak, but uh, that, that's the next, uh, the next thing I'm trying to do here. We've got a 2014 charge in Mississippi, and uh, we've got, uh, let's see, a 2015 charge in Louisiana. So it sounds like the, uh, the Mississippi case that's coming up here is going to be the first, at least in the order of timeline, uh, exactly the first death that he's alleged to have been involved with uh, by about a year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it, it seems like there's... <laughs> that there's going to be an awful lot of jeopardy for this particular defendant, you know, even uh, not only this case, but the Louisiana case as well. And the defendant does have, as you mentioned, a, a prior criminal history. Now, there's uh, been a couple of theories that have been debunked here, one of which is this theory that the defendant had lighter, or excuse me, not the defendant, that the victim, Jessica Chambers, had lighter fluid uh, in her nose or her throat. That's been widely publicized, but it has... Uh, as my understanding, been debunked that that's not what happened. It was just gasoline that she apparently was doused with and set on fire. Do you think that the uh, the state or the defense is going to have to kind of get uh, into some of these debunked theories just in case somebody on the jury has heard about them? Boy, what a good question. Um... I don't know. I mean, if I were a prosecutor, I would not want to be raising those kinds of red herrings. I don't want to keep my case relatively simple and straightforward for a lay jury. Um, so I don't think it would be the prosecution's interest to bring that up. I don't, for that matter, I don't really see how much help it would be to the defense for that matter either. Well, maybe the I, defense I, could, if it came from the mouth of someone who was investigating, maybe the defense could try to wedge in and, and say uh, in some kind of cross-examination, you know, hey, look, you know, uh, back early in this case, you said this happened and that's not true, correct? And then, of course, the answer is, well, no, and they could try to use it as a, a, a tiny, tiny sliver or wedge in, into the whole reasonable doubt thing. But, right. um you know, I don't know. Um, I mean, right. Any, a, anything an which would erode even the slightest bit the credibility of the um, prosecution witnesses, of course, is going to be of some help to the defense. So I, I guess I can see your point there. Um, I'm just, I don't know, for some reason I'm skeptical that it will do that much good if that's the best the defense has. But well, yeah, you're, you're right. Uh, that's why I said the, the tiniest sliver of reasonable doubt. Uh, I certainly right. don't think that that makes it the, all, all the way up and down. Uh, now, let's talk about this case from a defense perspective. Where does the defense go? Well, I mean, you know, all you have to do is to get one juror to uh, be convinced that there is reasonable doubt. You know, not that the defendant didn't do it or not to identify who actually did do it, but just to get one juror to be convinced that there is reasonable doubt. And if this uh, cell phone testimony can be impeached, if the defendant can bring up the fact that the technology is not lock solid, that you don't always know for sure what these cell phone records indicate, it's not a 100% kind of thing, and that maybe the defendant wasn't at the location at the relevant time. If that's all the prosecution has to link the crime to this particular defendant, then, you know, it seems to me that the defense strategy of trying to pick away the credibility of the cell phone uh, evidence is the way to go. It would seem that that's going to be... I agree where things will probably go. And, you know, keep in mind where this happened. This happened in a rural part of Mississippi. Now, if I walk out the door here at Law News with my phone, uh, I'm probably right now on a network with anywhere between 2,000 and how many other people uh, because I'm in midtown Manhattan. But, uh, you know, when I'm in the rural Northeast or when I'm in rural Mississippi, I have been to rural Mississippi, uh, you know, I, I might be on a tower with maybe five or ten other phones tops. Well, that kind of limits down the possible number of suspects unless the defense is going to argue that somebody did it who didn't even have a phone. Right. Yes. I mean, and, and that's not inconceivable that uh, the person didn't have a phone or the phone was turned off or, or something like that, I suppose. Um, I think you're right. I think it's a different analysis when you're in a rural area and there are only five people on the network. Of course, there are some people who maintain that the 
the data itself is inaccurate. That not only could it be somebody else who was present at the time, but even the, the pings that suggest that this defendant was present at this location at this time, maybe that's not accurate. And if, if you've got competent testimony to that effect, then I suppose that could cause a reasonable doubt. My understanding is that the accuracy of that kind of information has improved over the decades, and the kind of cell phone tower ping evidence that they used back in the 90s, which maybe was a little bit shaky, um, is less so nowadays, but it ends up being a judgment call for the jury, it seems to me. Yeah, so uh, another weird fact here that uh, I'm curious as to your opinion on, Stephen, uh, apparently the victim, Jessica Chambers, had muttered something which a lot of people think was a name uh, between the time when first responders showed up, found her with burns over 98% of her body, uh, and when she expired the next morning in the hospital. Mm -hmm. She apparently said something that the first responders thought sounded like the name Eric or Derek. Mm -hmm. And apparently the police tried to follow that lead, and ultimately it led them nowhere with the case pointing them back, the facts pointing them back at Quentin Tellis. Now, how does either side deal with that particular piece of information? Well, I think the defense obviously wants to take that and, and run with it. Uh, you know, one of the best ways for a defense lawyer to create reasonable doubt is to suggest that there's evidence pointing in the direction of some other uh, perpetrator other than the defendant. And so if, you know, these first responders are going to be put on the stand by the prosecution, you can bet that the defense counsel under cross-examination will be eliciting this testimony. Um, and that furthermore, that law enforcement took it seriously enough to actually pursue these leads. And the fact that they couldn't find anybody They'll suggest that the real killer is still out there. And, you know, even if that's only speculative, it might be enough for reasonable doubt and the part of one juror. On the other hand, the prosecution is going to have to put that to rest. And, you know, I think, you know, there is some reason to suggest that as badly burned as the victim was, I'm sure there'll be some competent medical testimony to suggest that, you know, the, the defendant, the victim may not have actually had her wits about her, she may not have been able to accurately identify or articulate uh, the kind of uh, sounds that you need to correctly identify the, uh, the, the, uh, the assailant, in which case you just take all that evidence and put it to the side, which is, I think, what the prosecution will probably argue. Yeah, now, I mean, it seems plausible to me that to someone who faced uh, the excruciating burns that this particular victim did uh, would have trouble naming someone in the state that she was in. Uh, and maybe the first responder misheard something. Maybe the victim was just unable to pronounce it. If I were on the jury, I would just sort of wipe uh, away those words, but that's just me. It may be that uh, once this testimony gets fleshed out a little bit more, assuming that it is, that it, it could go in a different direction. So I'm curious to see exactly how the state and the defense uh, will both deal with that particular fact, but I suspect it's probably going to have to come up. As you said, the defense is, is sure to bring it up if the state doesn't bring it up initially. And if I were the prosecutor, uh, assuming that uh, Mississippi is a state that allows uh, either side to impeach a, a witness, I would, uh, or regardless, I would bring it up first and say, hey, look, we investigated everything. We hit all the dead ends. We covered every single base. We did not go charging off after this one defendant. We looked everywhere we could, and yet all the signs point to Quentin Tellis. I would yeah. want to argue that as a prosecutor. Oh, no, I think you're exactly right. I mean, any prosecutor with his or her assault is going to bring up potentially damaging evidence in direct to take the sting away from it so that it doesn't appear to the jury that they were hiding anything and there's some huge damaging revelation on cross-examination. And specifically, with respect to this particular type of potentially damaging information, I think you're right. The proper argument for the prosecutor is to say, well, of course we followed up that lead. We follow up every lead. That's what we do. We're thorough investigators. But those leads ultimately proved, uh, led nowhere, um, which is why it's legitimate for the jury to discount, the, discount them, put them to the side, and focus on the evidence that does point to this defendant. Exactly. Uh, that's the way that I would handle it. Now, one more question for you. This uh, issue of the defendant being charged as a habitual offender, it's on the grand jury indictment along with the capital murder charge. And uh, we were back and forth a little bit before we went on the air as to how that's going to be dealt with. If that's information that gets presented to the jury in this case, does it make it a lot easier for the prosecution to win because then the jury gets to hear all of the defendant's previous criminal record, basically? 
you know, right. we, we've got we've got that general rule of character evidence, and and we're we're supposed to try people for each crime uh, separately uh, because it, it prevents the the old uh, game of just rounding up the usual suspects. Oh yeah, this person did uh, burglary, another burglary, and uh, a felony fleeing, and he's a bad guy, and it probably makes him more likely to have been involved in this murder because logically, in a pure logic standpoint, the chain just doesn't go there. Uh, right. You know, we don't want to just round up the usual suspects because then we wind up catching the wrong people. But if the jury has to reach the fact that this guy's a habitual offender, is it more likely to get a conviction on the top uh, capital murder charge? Right. Oh, that's an excellent point, Aaron. I hadn't really thought of that. As you mentioned, that the law generally says that you don't want to use so-called propensity evidence. The defendant did a bad thing in the past, therefore he probably did this bad thing. You don't really want the jury to be engaging in that kind of analysis, so you typically do exclude that kind of evidence. There are exceptions to that rule, as you know. If you can think about uh, the, the prior conviction relating to some specific method or, uh, or motive that's relatively unique in an identifying uh, piece of information or detail, sometimes you can get it in that way. And then obviously, if the defendant were to take the stand, very often you can use prior convictions to uh, impeach the defendant and attack the defendant's credibility as a witness. Assuming that none of that applies in this case, because the defendant is not taking the stand, uh, then, yeah, you're right. To the extent that this becomes, this habitual offender status becomes something that the jury has to find, well, then that, I guess, is to the prosecution's advantage because they'll be able to introduce evidence of the prior conviction. I was thinking earlier that it might be to the prosecution's advantage that the jury doesn't have to find that, that it's just the kind of thing that you could just enter the documents into the record and get the judge to just rule it, so it will be one less thing you'd have to prove to the jury. But after having think, thought about it now, I, I, you might be right. It might be to the prosecution's advantage to be able to get that evidence in. Now, you remember the Supreme Court case off the, the tip of your tongue, which I apparently have read and forgotten. Forgive yeah, me. Yeah, Apprendi. Uh, you know, about whether or not this habitual offender information needs to be a question for the jury to find or whether it just happens due to the turning of the gears of law behind the scenes. Right, uh, right. And know, the, the Supreme Court case in question is Apprendi v. New Jersey. Coincidentally, I happen to have been in the Supreme Court the day that it was argued. I was able to listen to the oral arguments. And what the court ruled in that case, and then there's a series of successor cases following Apprendi that basically are consistent with that, is that any fact, any finding of fact about the crime that would increase the overall severity of the sentence must be found by a jury and cannot be found by uh, the judge. However, in that case, Apprendi and subsequent cases, the Supreme Court carved out an exception for prior criminal history. The defendant's prior record does not need to be found constitutionally by the jury. You could just enter the records and then have the judge find that as a matter of fact. Now, it could be that Mississippi follows that rule, or it could be that Mississippi by statute has decided to give the defendants a little extra protection and says that even prior criminal history should be found by the jury. I don't happen to know what Mississippi does. Well, it ultimately forces into, uh, into focus the question that I started off this part of the discussion with, is, and that's, is it more prejudicial to the defendant to uh, throw all of his prior bad acts in? Uh, you know, and, and then that raises another question. We, we can just keep pondering this forever, I guess, here. This sounds like a good hypothetical for your next law school exam. But, <laughs> you know, uh, so, so if the jury has to find it in all of the bad acts, you know, the, the two other burglaries and the fleeing the scene get thrown in in front of the jury under this habitual offender thing, assuming the jury has to find it, does then that make it easier for the defendant to make the decision to testify because the information is already out there? He won't get hit with it uh, on, well, he probably would get hit with it on cross-examination, but uh, it wouldn't uh, be the first time it would come in. Yeah, I think that's a good point, Aaron. I mean, in terms of the defendant's uh, strategy, uh, if this habitual offender uh, information is something that needs to be determined by the, the jury, as defense counsel, first, I would probably offer to stipulate to it so that we would just sort of get it into the record and not be able to have to actually uh, have the jury listen to testimony about it. So just sort of get it in, since it's going to come in anyway. And as you pointed out, if that impeaching evidence comes in, and that's it for potential impeaching evidence, if there's no, no other red you know, skeleton in the closet, if you will, of the defendant, well then, why not go ahead and let the defendant take the stand? Because the impeaching material is already going to be before the jury anyway. 
Yeah, uh, th these are these are the questions that go through my mind uh, as I sit here and try to unravel some of the the um, you know, some of the procedures here. But uh, you know, normally in a case, defendants tend more often to take the stand if they have no prior criminal history, and they tend not to take the stand if they do, because normally, uh, if the defendant is not on the stand the prior criminal history, generally speaking, cannot come in. But if the defendant takes the stand, that prior criminal history can come in uh, as a means for the prosecution to impeach the defendant. That's, right, that's, that's usually the, the case. The, the general rule, and uh, we talk about it a lot here, but in this case, if this habitual offender information has to come in because it forces the penalty up a notch, then this will be really interesting to see whether or not this defendant takes the stand. Yeah, it's an interesting point, Aaron. Yeah, well, I'm glad that I raised it. Uh, hopefully, uh, you know, if I were sitting in your class in law school, I, I would get a participation point for, <laughs> for forcing the discussion. You might even get an A. We'll into the, well, yeah. gee, uh, then I should have gone to your law school then. <laughs> so, uh, Professor Stephen Mulroy, former federal prosecutor, current criminal defense attorney, University of Memphis School of Law uh, from Tennessee. Appreciate you joining us today on the Law News Network. Thank you. Take care. All right.